A reader lives a thousand lives before he dies. The man who never reads lives only one. Come into the reading room, all you lovers of language and literature. This is the place for those of us who believe that reading is essential as we seek to rise above the ordinary. And the reading room contains a host of extraordinary people, leading lights of the written word. Authors, literary critics, columnists and ideas people will tantalize your minds with their wordplay while discussing the ideas and worldviews that form our wonderful literary milieu. Come step into a world of magic, the place of undiscovered treasures, a room of reading. And welcome into the warmth of the reading room. Well, if you're sitting in Johannesburg or Joe Friesingburg, as we like to call it at the moment, not so warm, but the two gentlemen I'm had joining me in our virtual studio are definitely, well, it looks like they're in much warmer climes considering they're both in short sleeves and I'm sitting here in a big woolly jacket. So before we get into introducing them, I've got to talk about the fact that there is no such person as Michael Stanley. You may have seen books by Michael Stanley. There is no, well, there may be some people called Michael Stanley, but not in this particular case. So joining me from Neisner, down in uh, the sunny south coast, we have Michael Sears, and all the way from Minneapolis in the US. Yes, I mean, the marvels of modern technology. We're chatting with Stanley Trollope as well. So that's where it comes from, Michael and Stanley. How are you both today? Very well, thank you. And thank you for having us on your program. Absolutely yeah. wonderful. And Stanley, all good over there in the US? It's delightful. And as I have said before, it's uh, going to be 35 degrees today. 35 degrees. I can only um, think about those days and, and hope for them again. Okay, so before I ask you how you got into working together, and that, that for me in itself is a thing, how does one write a book when there's two people? Firstly, Stanley, what is your background? Where did you have your field of study in the past? Well, I was born and grew up uh, in, in Joburg, in Joe Friesingburg, <laughs> and went to, to Witz uh, as an undergraduate in the arcane area of statistics. And then I went to the University of Illinois, just south of Chicago, and ended up getting a, a doctorate in the use of computers in education. Okay, from that to author, we'll get into that in a moment. And Michael, your background? Yeah, well, my background is uh, even at, at least as far away from being a fiction author as, as Stanley um, is. Um, I grew up in, in Cape Town, actually, and um, then uh, I lived in Kenya for a while, and then I went with my parents to Adelaide in Australia, did my university training there, and then I came back to Wits as a mathematician. And uh, from there, I was involved in applied mathematics and remote sensing, and I was dean of the Faculty of Science for a while. And then uh, we decided to write a book. Okay, now this, this is like really confusing for a blonde, especially we're talking about statistics and applied mathematics. And yes, we all had to do some of that stuff at school. But as you said, that is like really far away from writing a book, and especially when it's not a book which is about computers or about mathematics. So where on earth did this come from? Well, I think the uh, the the initial point is that, that we should make is that when we started writing, and Stan may tell you a little bit about uh, how that happened, but when we started writing, we didn't know anything about writing fiction. We'd both written nonfiction, and we'd always done it with other people. So to us, you know, well, we've been writing these things, and we've been collaborating, so... Why not? In other words, we didn't even know enough about writing fiction to realize that it's not something that you just pick up and then start doing. But we learned. Okay. And, and from yours, is Stanley, where, where did the entire – I know that the two of you only started writing a book about, what, 20 years after you had the initial discussion. But take me back to the time where the first idea came from. I'm a, a private pilot, and every year – I came back from the United States during the uh, Northern Hemisphere summer, so July, August time, uh, to see my friends and family. And I would rent a small plane. 
and get a bunch of friends like Michael and so on. And we would go on safaris, if you like, into Botswana and Zimbabwe. Mm -hmm. uh, all of us were avid bird watchers and game watchers and so on. And it was on one of those trips, we were in the uh, Savuti Plains in, in the Chobe National Park in Botswana. And we saw a pack of hyenas attack and kill a wildebeest. They are ferocious hunters. Most people think mm -hmm. of them just as scavengers. But when they're hungry, you don't want to be in their way. And in about four hours, they devoured the entire wildebeest, bones and all, because hyenas eat the bones as well. And that evening, probably over a glass or two of wine, we said, if we ever want to get rid of a body, the place to do it is leave it out for the hyenas. Mm -hmm. Because if there's, no, if there's no body, it's very hard for the police to have a case. You're indeed right. It's like you know somebody getting rid of the, the murder weapon by hitting somebody with a pork top and then eating it afterwards. But okay, so, what, <laughs> so there you are. You've got the, these devilish thoughts going through your mind. What was the, the spark that actually made you think, hang on, let's actually write this book? Well, we spent a long time talking about it, as, as you mentioned earlier on. Uh, both of us were very involved in our other careers at that stage. Stan went back to Minneapolis and uh, and I went on with my career in Johannesburg. But we got to know each other originally because I spent time in Minneapolis on sabbatical quite frequently. So time went past and the ideas sort of uh, matured in our heads perhaps or just the idea of doing it matured. And then one day, one of us, I think I was the person, had a spare afternoon and I sat down and I said, um, all right, well, let's actually try this. Let's see if there's anything in this in the story. And I wrote the first scene, which involves a game ranger and uh, an ecologist who are uh, doing some research work in a game reserve in Botswana. And they see some vultures and they approach to work out what's going on. They're afraid of poaching and they find this hyena eating a dead body. And then the ecologist is very smart and he decides that this is not a tourist who's got lost or something like this. This is in fact a murder. And he explains to the game ranger why and they agree and call the police. Mm -hmm. And at that point, I sent this chapter over to Stan and I said, well, Stan, what do you think? You know, I just thought I'd I'd write the idea, see what happened. And Stan replied that he thought it was pretty interesting and uh, it seemed to be going quite well. And what happened next? So I said to him, well, I don't know what happened next. This is supposed to be a collaborative venture. And it was over to him. I've always wondered, is that the way that when people are working together on a book, does one person write a chapter and think, well, hang on a second, let's take the story in a different way so the entire thing kind of can meander in a, in a completely different direction to what you had initially thought of? Or do you plan it out from inception to the closure right at the end of the book and then work it like that and take – who takes the chapter kind of notes? Who who decides on who's writing what? I mean, this must be quite a thing because I know I get precious about stuff – I'm not even working with another writer. I'm working with a photographer. So, <laughs> and we still fight about things. How did that process work with you guys? Well, just as a little background, there, there are generally in fiction two broad categories of writer. There are the plotters, as you have mentioned, people who sit down and plot out the entire book, sometimes chapter by chapter. Mm -hmm. uh, Jeffrey Deaver, a very, very well-known writer, is like that. So by the time he reaches the end of his outline, half the book is already written. Then there are other people, which we call pantsers, people who write by the seat of their pants, and they don't have a very detailed outline. Mm -hmm. And for the most part, we fall into the category of pantser. When we start a book, we normally have a decent idea of who the bad guy is, but not always. Uh, we know what the major crime is. We know what the general backstory is. And that's about it. And mm -hmm. then off we go. And in many ways, it can be an inefficient way of writing because you write yourself into dead ends and you realize this particular strand isn't going anywhere. So you have to backtrack and try a different strand. 
But what we like to say is that it's very unfair uh, for readers to wait until the end of the book to have this big surprise as to who the bad person is. We like to do the same thing. Uh, we can write 80% of a book not knowing who the villain is. <laughs> and then we are e equally surprised at the end. <laughs> I like that way of thinking. Keep yourselves going as well. I mean, I've just been watching a couple of uh, the kind of Sherlock Holmes types movies in the last couple of days. And, and I sit there the entire thing thinking, no, it must be this. No, it must be that. And I love it when I have that where you're changing your mind the entire time. So, I mean, where would, who would you say are the people that have been kind of most – inspirational, I don't think is the right word for it, but who've kind of, you looked at and thought, actually, I like the way that they've written this. I like the way that their minds think. Um, I'm talking about like, you know, even big writers, smaller people that you've come across, or not pe smaller people, but, you know, <laughs> less known people. Well, I'm a big fan of John le Carre's work. And I've read most of his books multiple times. I read it the first time just to read it and enjoy it and see how it works out. And then I read it again because I come to points where I think he's just in the middle of a, of a chase. He's just had two pages of background. How did he make that work? How is that possible? You can't do that. It goes against all the rules. So I think I've learned quite a bit from his writing uh, that way. And that's just one example. Of course, there are lots of examples of, of people that you who's writing you you love and respect but i don't think one ever tries to emulate them exactly because you're never going to be as good as le Carre at writing british spy novels you know mm. you you've you've got to you've got to find your own theme and and work with that and for you stanley anybody that stands out in particular i know you've mentioned jeffrey deaver uh, already who i think is absolutely marvelous he really does keep the tension going but who else is there out yeah, I, there? That... I, the, the two books that have influenced me the most are not m mysteries at all. The first one, surprisingly, is, is Alice's Adventures in Wonderland. Um, it really opened my mind to the power of, of fantasy, of imagination. Mm -hmm. And I, I've read that many times. In fact, during COVID lockdown, I reread it just because I like it so much. And then the other one was a book that I read as a teenager, probably under the covers uh, when I was meant to be sleeping, and that was On the Beach by Neville Shute. And that was about a sort of a, an apocalypse about to hit the, the planet. And when I eventually finished the book, probably at three in the morning, and closed it and turned the light out, I did not expect to wake up. <laughs> and it was a real shock that I can remember to this day when my father walked in with a cup of tea you know, at 6.30 to get me ready for school. And that gave me insight into the power of the word. Mm. And, and really, that's what we do. I mean, any novelist is working on the imagination through words. Yep, so you've got to be kept in the fold, yeah. I mean, I, I think I mean, uh, you're, you're kind of a little bit older than me, not a lot, just a little bit. No. And we all grew up, we grew up reading, we grew up listening to radio. So we, we do have this ability to actually engage our minds. Sure, we can all sit and look at television and movies and whatever, but that kind of tends to just flow over you. But for me, it's always been about somebody has to get my attention and hold it, whether it's, uh, it's the spoken word or the written word, which I've always loved. But you were saying about getting your themes going, and suddenly it's a dead end. That's one thing, I mean, even with um, the Game of Thrones series, I mean, the, I haven't actually read the books, but which is surprising considering I'm such a fantasy fanatic, where they had all of those loose ends, all of these amazing stories that were set up that came to nothing. And even people like, um, what's her name, who wrote Harry Potter? J.K. Rowling, she <laughs> even had one or two things she, that she said where she she had a senseless murder and, and she, one thing she regrets was, was killing, I think, was one of the gnomes um, for absolutely <laughs> no reason. And she said there was, there was no point in having done that. Do you, have you ever had that happen? Because you, you guys have written, what, seven books now? Yeah. And have yeah. you ever had it where you suddenly looked at it afterwards and gone, uh-oh, oh, um, that was a bit of a, a loose end there that we didn't clear up and it was something that was not maybe not pertinent to the story or should have been pertinent? Has that ever happened? Or do you check each other? 
Well, well we, we do check each, each other, other a lot. <laughs> yeah, I mean, we do do that. We do check each other, of course. And and uh, the way in which our writing process works is very often that one of us comes up with an idea in a in a section or a chapter, or uh, we brainstorm it and we try and work out where it's going to go. To some extent, as Stan says, we're we're pencils, so uh, we don't expect to know where it goes at the end. But sometimes we, we pick up that it's just not going to go anywhere. We can make it happen, but it isn't going to lead anywhere. It's not going to take the story forward. But you're quite right. Of course, sometimes you have things which you put in which you thought were going to go somewhere and you thought were important to the story. And then it turns out that they're not. With our second book, um, our editor at HarperCollins in the States sent back the first draft of the manuscript, well, the first draft that she'd seen, and she said, these two characters that you've got here, they don't do anything in the book. <laughs> and we were both very offended by that because we'd put a lot of work into these characters. We rather liked them. And uh, they, they occurred in the first chapter and then on and off throughout the whole book. And we said to each other, well, I mean, that's a silly comment. I mean, for one thing, they, um, w well, it's important that they, um, 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 oh, uh, well, there is that thing at the end. And then her next sentence, when we read it, said, there is that thing at the end, but that's unbelievable anyway. <laughs> so after we'd got over the, the, the annoyance and we'd agreed, we realized that she was absolutely right. We rewrote the whole book from the beginning. Because you couldn't just delete the characters. They did do some not important things. Mm. So, yes, we've certainly been there. We've certainly been in the situation where we've had to do a lot of work to correct something which was really a pointless loose end, if you like. You've just got to say, though, those are my Rose and Kranz and Guildenstone. Leave them alone. I want to have them in the book, and that's all there is to it. <laughs> okay. no, but I, I, yes, you know, sometimes you do have characters that come along and you thought, why are they there? I don't understand why they're there, but that's, no. that's beside the point. Now, Stanley, has there ever been like fights where you've specifically wanted something in and you've had to fight with Michael to keep it in or vice versa? I don't remember anything specific, but it happens the whole time. I, and every time I write, so not every time, but very often when I write something, I get this red ink coming back. <laughs> my, my, but it is actually an interesting situation, and it happens both ways, that whenever we really love something that we have written and send it to the other one, the other one inevitably doesn't like it. Mm. And I think what has happened is that the writer has fallen in love with the words rather than fallen in love with how it fits into the story. And it, it's, it really is very mm. common that that happens to us. I can well imagine. I mean, as I said, I get quite precious. Like I'll have written something which I think is fantastic. And they say, don't you think that this might work better? And I'm like, no, absolutely not. Sorry, you can't change. It's not negotiable. Do you always manage to find a way through it? I mean, who, who's usually the one who backs down? I think we both. Uh, well, we have a we have an algorithm. <laughs> me, me, me. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what is your algorithm, Michael? <laughs> Our algorithm is He's that a we we talk it through. <laughs> right. We talk it through, and then we try and come to a resolution. And very often, we try to change the wording a bit. Over time, we've learned that uh, there are many different ways of saying the same thing, and some of them work equally well or not quite as well. Uh, but eventually, the final cut is that if we can't agree, we say, leave it the way it was, the way the person originally wrote it, and then the editor will change it because um, she'll obviously also see that it's wrong. Mm -hmm. It has never happened that the editor has changed any one of those occurrences, and I can't remember any single one of those occurrences from that day till this. Do you ever have like give the book to somebody else before you send it on to an editor to say, do you want to read through this and see what you think? Have you had that? And if so, do they come back and give you notes? Oh, yes. We, we have a, a group of people who are sort of beta readers, if you like. Uh, we want other people to look at it. I belong in Minneapolis to a writer's group. There are four of us, and we uh, meet once a month looking at each other's work. Mm -hmm. So during the process of writing, we get feedback. And then once the book is finished, we send the book to a number of readers 
some of whom are astonishing in terms of what they find and pick up, and they're absolutely invaluable to the mm. whole process. I want to be one of those people. I love reading. I think I, I would spend my life doing it if I could. Okay, but anyway, getting back to the books. Um, the first book that you were talking about was the hyena devouring a wildebeest and gotten taken out completely. The name of that book was A Carrion Death, yes? And that's where you introduced your detective. Now, is it a Kubu or just Kubu? Kubu. Kubu Bengu from Botswana. Why was it specifically set in Botswana? And I know it has a lot to do with diamonds, but I was wondering why. I mean, this is not the first series of books that have come out of Botswana, obviously being so um, an unusual place for, for world-renowned authors to set books. And, of course, all the ones about the <laughs> First Lady's Detective Agency and all of that, which I, I, I devour every time there's a new one that comes out. I really love Alexander McCall Smith's writing. It's quite odd. <laughs> and it is, I mean, I, I don't know how people overseas actually react to it. But I think, do you think that having a, an African background in some ways makes it a lot easier for an international audience to enjoy it because it is other, because it is African? And of course, Africa is this place of mystery for so many people. Well, I think that there are different answers to that. The people who enjoy reading international mystery and international thrillers, I think, uh, glom on to books like ours and, and other books that are set in Africa. I also think there's a large audience, more possibly in the States than in the UK, who don't venture abroad in their reading. They stay with their domestic writers. Perhaps they will venture to England. But I speak to a lot of people who say, oh, I don't really you know, need to read anything from anywhere else. Mm. So it's a mixed bag. And the, but the people who do venture abroad are, are voracious in their reading of, of other places and, and really, I think, love African mysteries. Mm. And so, so why Botswana from your point of view, Michael? I mean, apart from the fact you were flying over it all the time in aeroplanes and that kind of thing. Well, it, it was in Botswana that we saw this uh, this pack of hyenas that Stan referred to killing the wildebeest. But um, the original reason was that we wanted somewhere where a human body could be thrown out for hyenas. That's not so easy to do in South Africa. If you wanted to take a body into the Kruger National Park, let's say, you'd have to go in through a check gate and or you'd have to cut through the fence. It would be a a difficult thing to do. In Botswana, that's not the case at all with the Central Kalahari Game Reserve and Mabua Fuhubi. You can just drive in from the from the uh, bypassing road and and throw your your human body out in a convenient spot near a waterhole for hyenas. Okay, well I'm taking. So that notes was the here, reason. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> that was the reason that we chose Botswana originally. But it's actually turned out to be a, a, a big win for us. Uh, yes, of course, there's Alexander McCall Smith and, and other local writers in, in Botswana themselves, itself, of course, like uh, Unity Dow. But uh, there are, as you very well know, many excellent crime authors in South Africa who are exploring the the modern crime scene here. I mean, Dion Mayer, Mike Nickel yeah. uh, come to mind immediately. So what we had when we found that we were now writing a series, which is another story, we thought we were writing a book and then we suddenly had a contract for two books. So we were writing a series. But what we find is that it actually gives us an opportunity to explore different issues which are important in Southern Africa and interesting, both to local and international readers. Um, and each one of our books has had such a theme. So you mentioned Diamonds, which was the uh, backstory theme, if you like, for A Carry and Death. Uh, we've also had the Bushman people in the Kalahari, their, their plight. We've had the Chinese influence. We've had Muti murders. Uh, some of those, of course, are relevant in South Africa too, but they're in a different setting in Botswana because of the background that Botswana has been through. Mm. It doesn't all flow in a way from the, the legacy of, of apartheid. So we're very pleased, actually. We feel we're very lucky that, that the hyenas were in Botswana at the time we started writing the book. Gave you that little bit of impetus. 
And especially now, I mean, it wasn't how long was it about a month or so ago that they found that huge diamond in Botswana? I wonder if people are going to be mm-hmm. rushing up to there now that the borders have been opened again and like going diamond hunting. Now, Detective Kubu, um, he is he and he's in through all of the books. Is that correct? Correct. And so you ended up writing two books and then a third book, and then you were told, no, you're going to carry on with this. And you, did you sit there and go, oh, my goodness, what have we done? Where are we going to come up with stories? Or was it one of those things that you were like really excited because you've been thinking about it and thought, there's so much more we can do? I think it's a little bit of the latter. When we started, we really wrote A Carry and Death for ourselves. We were both mystery readers. We had this interesting idea and it took us three years to finish A Carrion Death. Mm-hmm. I was in Minneapolis at the time, and we thought, this isn't too bad. And some of our friends said, this isn't too bad. So I spent some time working at a Writers Guild here in Minneapolis, preparing a query letter to agents. And after the usual number of rejections, 30, 40 rejections, through a, an interesting set of circumstances that that doesn't have to be described, we landed up with a very good agent in New York. And within, I think, three weeks or four weeks, I got a phone call from her, and she said, I've just sold the book to HarperCollins. And she gave a number for the advance, and I fell straight off my chair. (laughs) Because we would have paid Harper Collins to publish it. <laughs> yeah, instead of having to publish your own, your own book yourself. <laughs> and in my silence, she misinterpreted it. She thought that we were, that I was disappointed in the number that she had said. She said, Don't worry, I haven't accepted it. I'm going to get them to pay more. <laughs> and, and then about a week later, she came back and said, They've increased their, their offer by 50%. I fell off my chair again, of course. And uh, she said, you are, of course, writing a series. (laughs) And we hadn't given the slightest thought to writing a series. So, of course, I said, naturally, everybody writes series. And she said, they want to see the summary of the second book next week. Oi. (laughs) And and basically, we, we did a very quick outline and sent it in, and they liked it. They gave us a two-book contract, and the second book is about the only book that we've stuck almost exclusively to what we had said at the beginning. Mm. All the others have largely been pantsed books. Pantsed, I love that word. I'm going to have to use that a lot more. Okay, so tell me about your newest release, the seventh in the series, but it's not, it's actually a prequel, isn't it? What is dear Detective Bengu going to be doing and where is he this time? What is this whole premise about? Well, as you said, it's it's a prequel. And uh, the reason for that is also is also quite interesting. We we had him appear in the in the first book because we needed a detective. We had the idea that the psychologist, who was an academic and smart and we felt well We've been told to write what we know, so at least we know about academics. So he was going to be the one who was going to be the protagonist and he was going to solve the mystery and so on. But we needed a detective. You've got to murder. You've got to phone the police and bring them into it. And so uh, uh, Kubu, who was a very large man, and uh, Kubu is, of course, uh, his, his nickname. Uh, Kubu means hippopotamus in, in Setswana. So you can imagine then physically what he's like. And also he's, he's quite like that from a, an emotional point of view as well. If, if you, you don't want to cross a hippo, hippos are dangerous animals. If you're between the hippo and the river, you're in bad shape. And if you're wearing and yellow, you're even better. The same. <laughs> <laughs> they, even worse, yeah. <laughs> so if you get between him and the, and the case that he's trying to solve, then he's, go, he's very tenacious and he's going to get his way through. But he climbed into his Land Rover, set out to try and find this uh, uh, this place where the body was, and uh, he took some sandwiches with him, and he took some some cassette tapes with opera on them because he likes opera, and he set out into the desert, and um, and that's basically how Kubu appeared. He wasn't planned, he wasn't thought through, he wasn't 
uh, designed as the protagonist. And then he started thinking about how he'd grown up and how he'd had a Bushman friend who'd shown him things in the desert and he'd decided that he wasn't going to be blind because his Bushman friend would point things out for, to him and he wouldn't have seen them. And so with that and the uh, jigsaw puzzles that he loved, he became interested in solving problems and solving detective problems. Mm -hmm. And by the time he'd actually arrived at the body, he'd taken over the book. There was no question anymore about the ecologist. Eventually, we married the ecologist off to Kubu's um, sister-in-law just as a consolation prize for the (laughs) fact that he got fired as the protagonist of the first book. But since Kubu appeared sort of ready-made like that, without terribly much thought about his background, that was a bit of a that was a bit of a hole. There was a bit of a gap uh, in his in his character, and we thought it would be nice to actually go back to when he started out as a detective, when he first joined the uh, CID in in Botswana, mm-hmm. and his first case. So the book, so Facets of Death, actually starts on the. Um, on the day in which he joins the CID. And he's not it's not an easy ride for him because he's coming straight from university. He hasn't been on the beat like most of the detectives. Mm. And uh, and they're they're not too impressed with this uh this upstart who's suddenly been pushed into this into this position. And it goes on from there. So all these wonderful books, what what is on the on the agenda next? I mean, is there a, another a contract for another book? Or we got to get through this one first? <laughs> well, we do have a contract for the next one, and we're very close to finishing it. It's the second in the prequel series, if you like. So this one that mm. we're writing takes place a, a few months after Facets of Death, the, the prequel that, that we just talked about. And it's set up in the northwest of Botswana, close to a little... Yeah, uh, further up, further up on the on the oh, even further on the Hansi, mm-hmm. okay. right on the on the banks of the Kavanga River before it spreads out into the Delta, in a round a town called Kasane and a village called Nkamasere, and very close to uh, Tsodelo Hills, which the Bushmen regard as the birthplace of humankind. Mm-hmm. And the book starts with a guy using a backhoe digging a trench to try and bring water from the Kavango River to an area they want to be irrigated. And he's doing this trench, and he looks at the bucket of his backhoe, and there is a skull looking at him from it. And, of course, now the police have to get involved. The fact that it's a skull and not a head means that it's quite old, and as uh, Kubu goes up as really as an observer, uh, because it's really expected that this is going to be more of an archaeological mm. dig than uh, a murder mystery. And eventually they find 10 skeletons, which clearly have been murdered and not the result of a sickness or something else like that. So you don't need a forensic so anthropologist, you need a cop. So Kubu, from being an observer of the uh, the Botswana police's uh, forensic pathologist, uh, suddenly starts getting involved, and there you are. That's that's the beginning of the story. I think we should be changing these into screenplays and shooting them in Botswana, and then you can find you can write me a role. How's that? I think that would be awesome. We would do that. <laughs> we would love that. <laughs> okay, I mean, I'm, I'm sitting here Absolutely. And I'm just looking at some of the. I mean, you know, the looking at um, how you've been so critically acclaimed. That what was it the first one? Carrion Death was a finalist for five awards, including the Crime Writers Association Debut Dagger. The third book won the Barry Award for Best Paperback Original Mystery and was a finalist for an Edgar Award. And Deadly Harvest was a finalist for an International Thriller Writers Award. I mean, this is absolutely amazing. And I'm sitting here and thinking, if I had to go to like 20 people that I know here in South Africa and say, do you know about Michael Stanley? Do you think that any of them would be able to say yes to me? 
They depend on which 20 people. <laughs> that's a good one, Michael. Yeah. But I mean, I've got. I mean, that's I've, a mathematician's answer. That's the, and what's the statistical answer, please? <laughs> the statistical answer is I doubt it. Yeah. It is actually quite a strange thing because I really, you know, I love, as you said, um, Dion Jaber, Mike Nichols, there's a whole bunch of the female writers. I read and I devour their novels and, and the ones from overseas as well. I see a, a new Patterson, although a lot of the Patterson ones. I'm wondering how much of it is him writing or the person he's writing with who's actually doing the writing. But the stories are all fantastic. Le Carré, when I was younger, Papillon, all of those books for me were just kind of, I used to like get into them head and body <laughs> most of the time. That's why I'm listening so avidly. Is where, where can you really get rid of a body that easily? Um, I, I sit there and I think most of the people I know will read all of those books as well. And I call it I call it my easy reading, obviously, also when you do your serious reading and the stuff that you do for university, that's your proper reading when you do like honors and masters in English and that kind of thing. You are a critical reader, but you need to have your fluff reading, which is what I like to have with this. So all my friends are mainly fluff readers. I mentioned this and they're like, who? So why is it, do you think that in South Africa, a lot of people are not even aware of the fact that there are so many amazing South African writers who are doing so much amazing stuff overseas until, like with Dion, you go and get some award, demerit or the other, something the other from um, the French president. Uh, the only thing I can think of is that perhaps people actually prefer books set in South Africa, that Botswana does seem a bit, again, one step away from, uh, from local and the other authors that you mentioned, the South African ones, are, of course, uh, setting their books in South Africa. And, and that has that local attraction that, that Stan referred to earlier. And there are a lot of writers in Minneapolis who set their books there. And they, of course, have a very big following in Minneapolis and in the, in the state and uh, more so in the United States. Some of them are also not known further afield. Again. Okay. Yeah, I just find it very strange a lot of the time. Maybe South Africans just aren't into reading South African. They want to like read all the big people you know, from overseas. One last question. Do you have a huge team of researchers? I mean, this is, as you said, this is not your field of expertise, when not just the writing, but also from what you've studied and what you've taught over the years. Um, getting into, I'm, I'm sure like wild, the wildlife stuff would be a lot easier. But I mean, do you have a lot of researchers and you're sitting there and thinking, hang on a second, um, we know nothing about this. Or do you just kind of ad hoc get hold of somebody who you've been told is an expert in something to be able to get the right information to put into the book? Well, for the most part, being academics, we are pretty good at research ourselves. And for the most part, we do that. We don't have a team behind us. We do, of course, ask for help from people who know a lot more than we do. But it's one, it's one of the wonderful things about writing these books is the research, mm. that that's part of the great pleasure that we gain from doing it. The other part is that somebody has to go to all these places in Botswana and make sure that we get the geography right. And so we, we force ourselves to do that. And every single place we've written about in Botswana, we've visited. We've had spoken to the commissioner of police. We've spoken to all sorts of people to make sure that what we are doing is as accurate as possible. Mm. Okay, well, if you ever need a uh, kind of an assistant researcher, I'm putting my hand up first here, okay. <laughs> okay, so Facets of Death is now already out and available in South Africa for people to go and get. Would you say that they should read from the first book all the way through to this one, or does it matter the order in which you read them? All the books are standalone, so you can, you can pick up any one of them and, and read it and hopefully enjoy it. Um, without having read the earlier ones. Some people do like to read the whole series because they see how the characters develop step by step over the series. Um, so in that case, you start with a carry and death. But Facets of Death is different. Because it's a prequel, um, you could actually argue that that's where you should start the series because it really introduces the uh, aspect of, the, of Kubu's background, which isn't in the other, in the other books. 
So actually starting with facets of death would, would be a very good idea in, in our opinion. Then read all the others. Go and get all of the others. They're all available, all of it, online, in store, and hopefully soon in the not too distant future, we may even get some audible books, get you to read well, them. Well, we have those. Already? We have those. Uh, we have several. The, there is, in fact, a very good recording of Facets of Death put out by Isis Audio in, in the UK, and it should be available in South Africa. Michael will have to tell you whether it is or not. A Carrion Death is available in audio. Uh, the Second Death of Good Luck Tanubu, which is called A Deadly Trade in the UK, is available. And I think Death of the Mantis and A Death in the Family are available in audio. That's a lot of death you've got going on there. <laughs> every, book has, every book has death. <laughs> Everything is about death. <laughs> Gentlemen, it's so lovely to have made your acquaintance, Michael Stanley. I sometimes think because you're sitting the other way around at the moment, I'm Stanley, Michael. I really do wish you the best of everything with these books. I think it's fantastic. I can't wait to get my hands on the latest one as well as on the new one. Please do let us know when it's out and about and we'll let people know as well. Thank you so much for having us. Okay. And um, for everybody Thanks. else, don't forget, get out there. I'm looking for Michael Stanley, distributed in South Africa by Jonathan Ball Publishers. Thank you to them for being what I reckon the best publishers in South Africa, but then I'm rather partial. Gentlemen, have a fantastic week and uh, stay, well, try and stay cool. <laughs> Some of us will warm up and we'll catch up with you again in the not too distant future. Thank you very much. You've been listening to another production from Solid Gold Podcasts.